The man known to history as King Leonidas I of Sparta was born around 540 BC in the Greek city-state which he would one day rule. His father was Anaxandridas II, the 15th king of the Agiad line, who ruled Sparta for nearly 40 years between around 560 BC and 520 BC. Together with his co-king Ariston, Anaxandridas ruled Sparta during a time when it cemented its position as the most powerful city-state in the Greek world. The name of Leonidas's mother is unknown, but according to the near-contemporary Greek historian Herodotus, she was the niece of her husband Anaxandridas. After several years of marriage, she had not produced an heir, prompting the powerful council of Ephes, the most powerful magistrates in Sparta next to the kings, to demand that Anaxandridas divorce her and marry a woman who could bear children. When Anaxandridas refused to do so, the Ephes allowed him to take a second wife while remaining married to his first. The king's new wife soon gave him his first son, a boy named Cleomenes. After he obtained his desired heir by his second wife, Anaxandridas returned to his first wife, who then surprisingly gave birth to three sons in quick succession, Dorius, Leonidas, and Cleombrotus. Leonidas was born into the Agia dynasty, the senior of the two lines of kings who jointly ruled over Sparta, both of whom claimed descent from the legendary hero Heracles. As the third son of King Anaxandridas II, he was not expected to become king, but he would, in the end, succeed to the kingship and become one of the most legendary figures of classical antiquity. Despite this reputation, little is known about Leonidas's life, and the main source of what we do know comes from the histories of Herodotus, the 5th century BC historian nicknamed the Father of History, who was the first writer to take an investigative approach towards events of the past. However, Herodotus was also notorious for embellishing his accounts of Greek history, and this makes determining the details of Leonidas's life additionally difficult. The city-state of Sparta, also known by the ancient Greeks as Lacedaemon, was located on the Eurotas River in the southeastern portion of the Peloponnese, the peninsula connected to the rest of Greece via the Isthmus of Corinth. The Peloponnese had been settled by the Achaeans, one of the four major Greek ethnic groups during the early period of Greek history. Sparta was home to the legendary King Menelaus, who led the Spartans in the Trojan War and fought to rescue his wife Helen after her abduction by the Trojan prince Paris. Menelaus is said to have ruled from the hilltop town of Therapne, while classical Sparta was founded on lower ground near the Eurotas by the Dorians from the east. Unlike other Greek city-states, Sparta was not properly urbanized and was more of a collection of villages. The town of Sparta itself was divided into the four villages of Petana, Limnae, Mosoa, and Sinusura. The four villages together with that of Amiclai to the south collectively formed the city-state of Sparta. Since the 900s BC, Sparta was jointly ruled by two kings of the Agiot and Europonte dynasties. The Spartans owed their constitution, known as the Great Retra, to a legendary figure called Lycurgus, who is said to have introduced his reforms around the 7th century BC. Under this system, the two kings of Sparta served as commanders of the army and were also members of the Gerasia, a council of elders whose membership included 28 other men aged at least 60 who were elected for life. In addition to serving as the Supreme Court, the Gerasia debated political issues before they were put to a vote in the assembly. They also had the power to veto the assembly's decisions. The members of the assembly were Sparta's full citizens, all of whom had to be of legitimate Spartan birth, and each underwent a rigorous training regime to serve in the Spartan army during their youth. Every year, the assembly elected a council of five ephors, one for each of the five villages who shared executive power with the kings, and sometimes overruled them. The ephors had extensive powers over foreign relations and served as ambassadors. Additionally, Two ephors would always accompany the king on military campaigns and could put him on trial for misconduct. 
By the middle of the 7th century BC, Sparta had a formidable hoplite army. Hoplites were heavy infantrymen who fought in phalanxes eight ranks deep, distinguished by a wooden round shield, based in bronze and decorated with the Greek letter lambda for Lacedaemon, which they carried on their left arm. They wore a large bronze helmet, a bronze breastplate, bronze abdominal guard, and greaves. Their main weapon was a long wooden spear with an iron tip, and they also carried a short sword for close combat. Spartan hoplites were distinguished from other Greek warriors by their long hair and long red cloaks. Sparta was a very religious society, and its kings would make sacrifices and consult oracles before going on campaign. Even in the heat of battle, Spartan commanders were known to take time to make sacrifices to inform their decisions. They had a unique attitude to death, considering it a badge of honor to be killed in battle, while survival in defeat was a humiliation. These customs and values were instilled into the Spartans from a young age. As a warrior society, boys of legitimate Spartan birth were separated from their families from the age of seven and brought up in the compulsory agoge system, where they would be raised by young Spartan adults who trained them as warriors. At the age of 18, the graduates with the greatest potential would join an elite military unit who served as members of the royal bodyguard of 300 men, senior army commanders, and would eventually become candidates for the Gerasia. The only Spartan boys exempted from the Agoge were the crown princes of the two royal houses. As Leonidas was not his father's eldest son, he would have joined his brothers Dorius and Cleombrotus in the arduous training regime. The elite Spartans were also members of a secret service called the Cryptia whose main function was to control the helots, the lower class of Spartan society who were effectively exploited as slaves and had once been from neighboring states such as Messenia, which were brought under Spartan domination from the 8th century onwards. Since the helots vastly outnumbered the Spartans, the Spartan constitution included measures to keep them under control. After a new set of ephors took office in the autumn, they would issue a declaration of war on the helots, which allowed free Spartans to kill the helots without being punished. A third class, which existed between the Spartans and helots, were known as Pyriosi, and these were men from neighboring towns and villages who were free subjects of the Spartans with obligations to serve in the army. As the Spartans were banned from engaging in any economic activities, the Pyriosi served as merchants and craftsmen, making the armor and weapons for the Spartan military. Sparta was just one of over a thousand city-states dotted around on the Mediterranean and Black Sea coasts, from the Straits of Gibraltar in the west to modern-day Georgia in the east, which collectively made up the Greek or Hellenic world. Although these communities were connected by a shared language, culture and religion, they were independent entities who would often fight each other over control of land and economic resources. Most Greeks lived in Europe but there was also a large population in Western Asia and a handful of settlements in North Africa along the coastline of places such as Cyrene, the ancient name for Libya. By the 6th century, many of these city-states had become democracies, but some continued to retain their kings or had been taken over by dictators and tyrants. Sparta was unique in being a diarchy with two kings. Around the time of Leonidas' birth, the most important and powerful city-states in mainland Greece included Thebes, Corinth, Argos, Sparta, and Athens. These city-states would then establish colonies further afield, some of which would become powerful city-states in their own right. Syracuse in Sicily was founded by Corinth, Ephesus in Turkey was founded by Athens, while modern-day Naples in Italy, which was known as Neapolis in ancient times, was initially settled by sailors from Rhodes. The only overseas colony founded by Sparta was that of Taras, modern-day Taranto in southern Italy. Unlike other Greek city-states, the Spartans satisfied the need for land by conquering the neighboring regions of Laconia and Messenia to the south and west. By the middle of the 6th century BC, the Spartans turned their attention to the region of Arcadia in the north. In around 550 BC, 
During the reign of Leonidas's father, Anaxandridas, the Spartans marched into battle against the Arcadian city-state of Tegea, carrying rods with which they would divide the land they expected to conquer and chains to shackle the prisoners they expected to capture. Instead, they suffered an unexpected defeat and ended up wearing the same chains as prisoners of war. The setback at the so-called Battle of Fetters prompted Sparta to change its policy from one of conquest to one of diplomacy under the influence of an ephor named Chilon. The Spartans soon claimed to have discovered the bones of Orestes and Tissamenus, the legendary son and grandson of King Agamemnon, the elder brother of Menelaus and supreme commander of the Greeks in the Trojan War. By bringing these remains back to Sparta for reburial, they claimed the inheritance of the Achaean kings and, by extension, the whole of the Peloponnese. Through these and other means, the Lacedaemonians were able to secure an alliance with Tegea. Over the course of the second half of the 6th century BC, these diplomatic initiatives led to the formation of an alliance known as the Peloponnesian League. Sparta was the leading power of the alliance and was not bound by reciprocal obligations to defend its allies. The one major Peloponnesian city-state which remained outside the League was Argos, a traditional rival which unsuccessfully challenged Spartan dominance in battle on several occasions in the 6th century BC. The death of Anaxandridas II in around 520 BC led to a succession crisis between his sons Cleomenes and Dorius. While Dorius claimed seniority as the son of his father's first wife and on account of his military prowess by going through the Agoge, the Spartans kept a tradition and acknowledged the elder Cleomenes as the rightful king. After his failed attempt at claiming the crown for himself, Dorius tried unsuccessfully to found a Spartan colony in North Africa and later Sicily, but was killed in battle against the Carthaginians in Sicily in around 510 BC. Cleomenes proved to be an effective king whose influence extended across much of the Greek world. In 510 BC, he led a land invasion of Athens that resulted in the expulsion of the tyrant Hippias and his sons. The Spartan intervention enabled the Athenian politician Cleisthenes to establish a democratic government, and in 507 BC, Cleomenes responded to the calls of the pro-Spartan politician Isagoras to overthrow Cleisthenes and install an oligarchy. Although the Spartans managed to occupy the Athenian Acropolis, the people declared in favor of Cleisthenes and forced the Spartan king to withdraw, sending Isagoras into exile in the process. The failed intervention prompted Cleomenes to lead a large Peloponnesian army alongside his co-king of the Euripontid royal house, Demaritus, against Athens the following year. The campaign of 506 BC proved unsuccessful when the army disintegrated after the Corinthians decided to withdraw their forces halfway through, following which King Demaritus also abandoned the army. Following the incident, Sparta agreed to create a Congress of the Peloponnesian League, where the Allies could vote for or against military action. In order to prevent future disagreements on campaign, the Spartans also changed their constitution, forbidding the two reigning kings from leading the Spartan army on campaign together at the same time. According to Herodotus, the Agiot and Euripontid kings of Sparta tended to view each other with suspicion and hatred, and after 506 BC, the disagreements between Cleomenes and Demaritus were not only political, but personal. This animosity continued for many years. In 494 BC, after defeating Argos in battle, Cleomenes was put on trial for failing to capture Argos itself. It is likely that Demaritus was behind the initiative. On this occasion, Cleomenes successfully defended himself and was acquitted when placed on trial before the ephors. Then, in 491 BC, following another disagreement between the two men, Cleomenes deposed his co-king and bribed the oracle at Delphi to declare that Demaritus was the illegitimate son of his father, King Ariston, and therefore his deposition was divinely sanctioned. Soon afterwards, the bribery was discovered, and Cleomenes is said to have gone mad and went into exile. 
He was then recalled to Sparta and arrested by the authorities. His accusers on this latter occasion may have included his brothers, Leonidas and Cleombrotus. After being placed in prison with a helot guard, he soon persuaded one of the guards to give him a knife and killed himself. Herodotus presents a number of alternative theories for the king's madness and suicide, the most common being that he had angered the gods when he bribed the oracle at Delphi, and his descent into insanity was divine retribution. The historian Paul Cartledge has raised the possibility that Cleomenes' death was not a suicide, but that he was actually murdered by his half-brother Leonidas, who was next in line to the Agiad throne and who succeeded Cleomenes as King Leonidas I in 489 BC. By the time he became king, Leonidas was married to Gorgo, the daughter and only child of Cleomenes. As Gorgo was born around 510 BC, the marriage would have taken place in the late 490s, when Gorgo was in her late teens and Leonidas was already around 50 years old. Marriage between close blood relatives was not uncommon for the Spartan royal houses, and Leonidas's own father and mother had been uncle and niece. Furthermore, as Gorgo was Cleomenes' only child and stood to inherit all his wealth, Leonidas would reunite a large part of his father's inheritance that had been divided among his four sons. Leonidas came to the throne towards the beginning of the Greco-Persian Wars, which saw Greek city-states in Ionia on the western coast of modern-day Turkey clash with the rapidly expanding Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was founded in the 550s BC by Cyrus II of Anshan, a client king of the Median Empire, ruled by his maternal grandfather, King Astyages. Both of these empires were based initially out of the region around modern-day Iran. In 553 BC, Cyrus rebelled against his grandfather, and by 550 BC, he captured the Median capital of Ecbatana, overthrowing Astyages' empire and proclaiming himself king of kings. Upon learning of this, King Croesus of Lydia in western Anatolia, the region around western Turkey along the coast of the Aegean Sea, sought to take advantage of the collapse of the Medes and consulted the Delphic Oracle, which informed him that he would destroy a great empire if he were to launch an invasion. Confident of victory, Croesus invaded Cyrus's empire from the west, only for the Persian king to counterattack and overrun Lydia by 546 BC, deposing Croesus and transforming the region into a Persian province. In 539 BC, Cyrus also captured Babylon and allowed the captive Jewish population to return to their ancestral home in Jerusalem. The great king then turned his attention east, where he managed to establish tributary relationships in India, but generally faced greater resistance. He is said to have died in battle in Central Asia, fighting against an army led by Queen Tomaris of the Massagetae in 530 BC. The Persian Empire continued its expansion under Cyrus's son and successor, Cambyses II, who conquered Egypt and the Levant during his brief reign. Cambyses' death in 522 BC led to a power struggle, which eventually resulted in the accession of Darius I, a powerful warrior who married Cyrus's daughter Atossa and claimed to be distantly related to the Persian royal house. After his coronation at Cyrus's capital of Pasargadi in around 515 BC, he established a ceremonial capital at Persepolis in the region of Fars in southern Iran. Though the main administrative center was in Susa, around 160 miles to the east of the Tigris River. In 513 BC, Darius embarked on his Scythian campaign, during which he built a pontoon bridge to convey his army across the Bosporus Straits into European Thrace, a region covering parts of modern-day Bulgaria, northwestern Turkey, and northeastern Greece. Although he struggled to defeat the nomadic Scythians, Darius subjugated the Thracians and forced King Amyntas of Macedonia to submit to his empire as a vassal. These new conquests strengthened the Persian Empire's northwest frontier and served as a base for further incursions into Greece. By 500 BC, 
Darius ruled over a vast multi-ethnic empire, which incorporated Indians in the east and Greeks in the west, and he set about reorganizing his father-in-law's disparate conquests in order to administer the provinces more effectively. Darius introduced a universal currency known as the Daric in his honor. He also divided the empire into around 20 provinces called satrapies, each governed by a satrap. Each of these governors was required to provide a minimum annual tax or tribute, as well as military obligations. And the satraps were expected to collect these taxes and raise contingents of soldiers on behalf of the great king. Although the Persian kings were Zoroastrians, who claimed to be representatives of the god Ahura Mazda, or Lord Wisdom, they were generally tolerant of other religions and were satisfied as long as they received the taxes and tributes they demanded from their imperial subjects in each of the provinces. By the end of the 6th century BC, many of the Greeks in the Persian Empire in Lydia and Ionia were unhappy with Persian rule, and in 499 BC, the Ionian Revolt broke out under the leadership of Aristagoras, tyrant of the city-state of Miletus in southwestern Anatolia. Although several Greek regions rose up in revolt, the rebels needed alliances with the powerful city-states on the Greek mainland in order to stand any chance of defeating the mighty Persian Empire. Aristagoras personally went to Sparta to ask for aid from King Cleomenes, claiming untruthfully that the Persians could be easily defeated. This was not the first time the Spartans had received a request for military assistance against the Persians. A half-century earlier, King Croesus of Lydia had recognized Sparta as the most powerful city-state in the Greek world, and when he faced a counter-invasion of Lydia by Cyrus's armies in the 440s BC, Croesus requested military assistance from Sparta, which on this occasion decided to only send a diplomatic envoy to warn Cyrus not to invade Lydia. By the time the Spartan arrived, Cyrus had already occupied the Lydian capital of Sardis. When Cleomenes asked how long it would take to get to Persia, Aristagoras informed him that it would take three months to march overland from Ionia to Susa. When Cleomenes refused, due to the great distances involved, Aristagoras informed the Spartan king of the great wealth of the Persian Empire and attempted to bribe him, gradually increasing his offer. According to Herodotus, Aristagoras eventually offered Cleomenes 50 talents of silver, an enormous sum of money at the time. But Cleomenes' daughter, and Leonidas' future wife Gorgo, who was not yet 10 years old, warned her father not to become corrupt and urged him to dismiss the foreigner. After Sparta's refusal to help, Aristagoras went to Athens and made the same arguments in an attempt to obtain Athenian assistance. As the Athenians claimed leadership of the Ionian Greeks, and had recently survived attempts by the former tyrant Hippias to overthrow their nascent democracy with Persian support, they agreed to support the revolt and joined the Ionians and Eritreans in sacking the Lydian capital of Sardis in 498 BC. Later that year, the Allies were defeated by the Persians at the Battle of Ephesus, and Athens withdrew from the alliance. The revolt continued until 494 BC, when a Persian fleet defeated the Ionians at the naval battle of Laid, near Miletus. After restoring his control over Ionia, Darius planned an invasion of Greece, both to punish Athens and Eritrea for siding with the rebels and to reduce the threat of the Greek city-states joining together to attack the empire again. Thus, in 492 BC, Darius's son-in-law and nephew, Mardonius, led a campaign to re-establish Persian authority over Thrace and forced Macedonia to give up its previous autonomy. But any further incursions into Greece were frustrated when most of the Persian fleet was shipwrecked near Mount Athos. The following year, the Persian king sent ambassadors to all the Greek states seeking their submission to Persian authority. Athens and Sparta signaled their refusal to submit by killing the Persian envoys. But a direct showdown between the Greeks and the Persians was drawing near. In 491 BC, King Cleomenes of Sparta had tried to use his influence 
to create an anti-Persian alliance between Athens and the nearby island city-state of Aegina, which had recently submitted to Persia. But his efforts at fostering Greek unity against the Persian threat were undermined by King Demaritus back home in Sparta, who criticized his co-king for siding with Athens, a traditional enemy against Aegina, a long-standing ally of Sparta. Demaritus is conspiring against Cleomenes, led directly to the latter maneuvering to depose the former. After being mocked in public by his successor, Leotichetus II, Demaritus left Sparta and took refuge in Persia, where he was given land by King Darius. In 490 BC, Darius launched an amphibious invasion of Greece, led by his nephew Artaphanes and a general named Datis. After easily subduing Eritrea and burning the city to the ground, the Persians turned their attention to Athens. Although the Athenians were an emerging naval power, they did not yet have the capability to prevent the Persian army from landing at the Bay of Marathon, around 25 miles to the east from Athens. The Athenians sent the long-distance runner Phidippides to request help from Sparta. It's uncertain if Cleomenes or Leonidas was king at the time, but when the Athenian arrived after running over 150 miles in 48 hours, the Spartans agreed to send 2,000 hoplites. However, they stated that they could not leave until a religious festival which was being celebrated in Sparta at the time was over. As a result, by the time these Spartans arrived, the Athenians and Persians had already fought the Battle of Marathon. The Athenian army was commanded by Miltiades, who had previously ruled over an Athenian colony in Thrace and fought under Darius in his Scythian campaign of 513 BC before siding with Aristagoras in the Ionian Revolt. Armed with his experience of Persian warfare, Miltiades deployed his army to block the exits of the plain of Marathon. After several days, the Persians decided to sail their army straight to Athens. While the Persian cavalry were embarking from their ships, Miltiades led his army of 10,000 men to attack the flanks of the Persian infantry before turning towards the center. Over 6,000 Persians were killed during the battle at the cost of 192 Athenian dead and an unknown number of casualties among Athens' allies from the city of Plataea. The Persians abandoned their ambitions to conquer Athens and returned home. This was the background against which Leonidas became one of Sparta's two kings. Not much is known about what happened in Sparta in the 480s BC after Leonidas became king. Although the Persians had been defeated at Marathon, the Spartans, Athenians and others fully expected that they would return before long. Darius died in 486 BC without fulfilling his ambitions to conquer Greece and was succeeded by his son Xerxes. After restoring internal order within his empire, he resolved to complete his father's unfinished work and made preparations for a campaign to defeat and subjugate the Greeks once and for all. News of these preparations reached Sparta in around 484 BC. Regretting the earlier decision to kill the Persian envoy sent by Darius in 491 BC, the Spartans decided to send a human sacrifice to the Persians in an attempt to appease the gods for their sacrilegious deeds seven years earlier. Two men volunteered for the sacrificial mission, and both were sent on the journey. But when they arrived at Xerxes' court at Susa and informed the great king of the proposed sacrifice, Xerxes laughed and considered it a joke. The cultural misunderstanding may have spared the lives of the two Spartans, but preparations for the invasion of Greece continued as before. As part of his preparations, Xerxes ordered a canal to be dug through Mount Athos in northeastern Greece, hoping to prevent a repeat of the disaster when the Persian fleet had attempted to go round the Athos promontory during Mardonius' invasion of 492 BC. Xerxes also ordered the construction of a bridge of boats across the Bosporus, or Hellespont, like Darius had done more than 20 years earlier when he first conquered Thrace. Unlike his father, Xerxes took steps to prevent any sabotage of these invasion plans by ensuring that his Greek subjects were not involved in the project. Instead, 
he ordered his Phoenician and Egyptian subjects to chain the boats together with thick papyrus rope. Xerxes could also count on a large contingent of Greek subjects, including the Thracians and Macedonians. Many Greek city-states which retained monarchies preferred the protection offered by the Persian Empire to the prospect of being overthrown by a democratic revolution and despite attempts by Herodotus to give the impression of a united Greek resistance to this latest Persian invasion, it is likely that more Greeks fought for Xerxes than against him when he launched the latest Persian invasion of Greece in 480 BC. Sparta was the first of the Greek city-states to be warned of an imminent Persian invasion. According to Herodotus, the deposed king Demaratus, who was in exile in the Persian Empire, continued to sympathize with his native land and decided to send a warning to Sparta. In order to keep the message secret, he inscribed it on a wooden tablet which he covered with wax to conceal the message. When the item arrived in Sparta, everyone was confused as to what it meant. But Leonidas's wife, Gorgo, suspected that there could be a hidden message underneath and suggested removing the wax. After the wax was burned away, Demaratus's message was revealed, and the Spartans passed on the warning to the other Greek city-states. While Sparta and its allies in the Peloponnesian League served as a powerful armed force on land, the Greeks continued to lack a major naval force. The Athenian political leader, Themistocles, who emerged as the most influential politician in Athens during the 480s BC, was a keen advocate for Athens to build its naval capacity in order to resist a Persian invasion fleet. In 483 BC, Themistocles exploited the discovery of a rich seam in the silver mines at Laurium and proposed to the Athenian assembly that the silver should be used to finance the construction of a fleet of 100 or 200 new triremes the fast and agile warships named after their three tiers of oars. As the Persian threat was considered rather distant for the time being, Themistocles claimed that the fleet was to be used against Aegina, which had inflicted a series of naval defeats upon Athens since siding with the Persians in 491 BC. The assembly voted in favor of the proposal, allowing Athens to build a fleet capable of confronting the Persians. Thus, by the time Xerxes began his final preparations for the invasion of Greece in 480 BC, the oracle at Delphi was able to inform envoys from Athens that while their city would be destroyed, the wooden wall shall remain unconquered. While some Athenians claimed that the oracle referred to the hedges that used to surround the Acropolis, Themistocles convinced his fellow Athenians to place their faith in his navy, which he believed was the wooden wall which the oracle was referring to as the salvation of Athens. In 481 BC, the representatives of the Greek city-states which sought to resist the imminent Persian invasion met at the Isthmus of Corinth, the narrow neck of land between the Peloponnese and northern Greece, where they agreed on a mutual defensive pact, bound as they were by religious, linguistic and cultural ties. The alliance included 31 city-states, half of which were members of the Peloponnesian League or otherwise associated with Sparta. Given its preeminent position among the city-states, Sparta was the undisputed leader of the coalition, and Spartan military commanders would lead the allied Greek forces on both land and sea during the war, even though the Spartans were not known for their naval prowess. On land, however, there was no disputing King Leonidas's credentials to lead the allied army. In the spring of 480 BC, Xerxes finally led his invasion force across the pontoon bridges he had painstakingly constructed over the Hellespont in the past few years. While Herodotus claimed that the invasion force numbered over two million men, based on the capacity of the Persian Empire at the time, it is unlikely that Xerxes' army would have exceeded more than 200,000 men. Herodotus claims that the invasion force included up to 60 ethnic groups, including Persians, Medes, and Parthians from Iran, Bactrians from the region around modern-day Afghanistan, Indians from what is now the Punjab, as well as a wide array of other subject peoples, such as the Lydians, Arabians, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, 
and even many Greeks. The Persian force included the 10,000 strong royal bodyguard known as the Immortals, who were commanded by a nobleman named Hydanes. According to Herodotus, the Persian fleet numbered over a thousand ships, including large contingents from the Phoenicians, Egyptians, Cypriots, and more than 300 ships from the king's Asian Greek subjects. Among the latter were five warships commanded by a woman named Artemisia, who was queen of Halicarnassus. The large Persian army proceeded at a slow pace through northern Greece, partly as a result of the army's long supply train and partly due to Xerxes' desire to use its imposing presence to present a sense of inevitable victory which would convince wavering Greeks to submit to Persian rule. In July, the Persians approached the Vale of the Tempe, on the border between Macedonia and Thessaly. An allied Greek army of 10,000 men, under the joint command of the Athenian Themistocles and a Spartan named Euanitus, awaited the invading force. When King Alexander I of Macedonia alerted the Allied army of the imminent arrival of Xerxes, he informed Themistocles and Euanitus not only of the vast numbers of men and ships in the invading force, but also that the Allied defenses could be outflanked. This information prompted the Allied army to withdraw and return to the Isthmus of Corinth for further deliberations. The wavering Thessalians submitted easily to the Persians, allowing Xerxes to continue his march south without much difficulty. In the meantime, the Persian fleet sailed to Cape Sepius, opposite the island of Euboea. After withdrawing from their first defensive position, the Greek allies decided to resist the Persians by land at the Pass of Thermopylae and by sea at nearby Cape Artemisium on the northern tip of Euboea. Despite the desperate military situation, the religious calendar proved a complicating factor for the Greek coalition. As the Olympic Games were due to be held that August, held in honor of Zeus, king of the gods, the Olympian Games were one of four Pan-Hellenic Games which brought together athletes and spectators from all over the Greek world. Sparta's religious obligations were twofold, as they were also preparing for the annual Carnea festival in honor of the god Apollo. Nevertheless, as leaders of the anti-Persian coalition, the Spartans had to send an army to Thermopylae as a gesture of resistance. Otherwise, the coalition could easily fall apart, with individual city-states siding with Xerxes in the face of his advancing army. Furthermore, the Spartans had consulted the oracle at Delphi, which had informed them that either Sparta would be occupied by the Persians, or they would be mourning the death of a king. Guided by these considerations, Sparta sent King Leonidas and a small army of 300 hoplites for the defense of Thermopylae. Although this was a small percentage of the 8,000 or so Spartan warriors available, most of the 300 would have been part of the elite royal bodyguard. Leonidas also stipulated that the men who accompanied him were to have a living son, a sign perhaps that the king was convinced, perhaps owing to the oracle's declaration, that he and his 300 men were destined to die in battle. Accordingly, he wished to ensure that each of the 300 men's family line could be continued by their surviving sons. When Leonidas left for Thermopylae, he advised his wife Gorgo to, quote, marry a good man and have good sons, though they already had a young son of their own named Pleistarchus. With this done, Leonidas and the 300 marched to Thermopylae perhaps aware that death awaited them there. It is this spirit which led two men to volunteer to sacrifice themselves to the Persians in the name of peace in 484 BC, only to be misunderstood by Xerxes. Such misunderstandings were less likely during Xerxes' invasion of 480 BC, as he had with him a prominent Spartan advisor, the same Demaritus who had been removed as king of Sparta by Cleomenes 11 years before. Earlier in the campaign, the great king asked him whether the Greeks would be motivated to resist. Demaritus replied that his fellow Spartans, quote, will fight as no others, no matter how few against however many, and that they were accustomed not to retreat from the battlefield, even when outnumbered, to stay in formation and either to win or to die. 
However, Xerxes foolishly dismissed the very notion that men would fight so courageously of their own volition. In addition to the 300 elite hoplites, the Spartan army also included around 1,000 perioci and the same number of helots. These were reinforced by small contingents of Peloponnesian allies, allowing Leonidas to march to Thermopylae with around 4,000 men. As they approached the pass in northern Greece, the coalition army was joined by 1,100 Boeotians and contingents from the neighboring Locrians and Phocians, each of whom contributed around 1,000 men. Adding all these disparate contingents together, Leonidas commanded an army of some 7,000 men at Thermopylae, awaiting the Persian horde. The name Thermopylae means hot gates in Greek. This describes a narrow pass between the Calidroman Massif, a mountain to the west, and the Gulf of Maliakos to the east. There were three such gates through the region. Leonidas deployed most of his men at the middle gate, a 15 to 20 meter long stretch at the narrowest point of the pass. The gate was already protected by an existing Phocian wall, and upon their arrival, the Greeks began to refurbish it. Leonidas was soon informed by men from nearby Trachis that there was a narrow mountain path called Anapia, which snaked around the pass and emerged around the east gate to the rear of the Greek position. Accordingly, the Spartan king ordered his 1,000-strong Phocian contingent to guard the path, which was so narrow that in places men could only advance in single file. Any attempt by the Persian fleet to attack the Greek position from the sea was protected by the Greek fleet at Artemisium, commanded officially by the Spartan Eurybiades, but in effect by Themistocles. Leonidas's Peloponnesian allies may have hoped that Xerxes would not arrive until the end of the Olympic Games, and their home cities would have time to summon their full contingents to do battle at Thermopylae. But the Persian army arrived in mid-August, with the religious festivities still ongoing. At this juncture, the Peloponnesians suggested to Leonidas that they should withdraw to the Isthmus of Corinth and await further reinforcements there. The king of Sparta briefly considered this, but protests from the local Locrians and Phocians at the prospect of being abandoned to face the Persians alone prompted Leonidas to keep his army at Thermopylae, while sending messengers to allied city-states to request reinforcements as soon as possible. A famous incident occurred at this time when a soldier complained to Leonidas that the Persian army was so large that its arrows would blot out the sun. The Spartan king unfazed by such a daunting prospect, remarked that if that were so, the Greeks would have a comfortable time fighting in the shade. However, Herodotus attributes the quote to a Spartan warrior named Dionysus. When Xerxes was deploying his army at the western end of the pass, he sent a scout on horseback to find out what the Greeks were up to. The scout returned to report that he had seen a small number of Greeks doing gymnastic exercises in the nude, while others were combing their long hair. The report astonished the great king, who summoned Demaratus to explain this seemingly effeminate behavior. Demaratus immediately recognized these men as Spartans and informed Xerxes that by dressing their hair, they were performing a ritual as part of their preparations to fight to the death. Xerxes had come to distrust Demaratus by this time, and took this warning lightly, dismissing the notion that these men were the boldest and noblest of all the Greeks. Expecting that sooner or later Leonidas and his men would take flight, Xerxes waited for four or five days until he finally decided to attack on the 17th of August, 480 BC. Before doing so, he sent an envoy to Leonidas, promising the Greeks their freedom and lands in Asia if they surrendered. After the Persian envoy was refused, he returned with a message from Xerxes, asking Leonidas and his men to hand over their weapons. In response, the king of Sparta uttered a characteristically brief two-word challenge, Molon Labe, come and take them. Xerxes answered Leonidas's challenge by sending a 2,000-strong Median contingent who were among the best soldiers in his army against the Greeks. However, the lightly armed Medes were unable to make much progress, 
and hundreds fell as they clashed with the heavily armed Spartan hoplites. The Median javelins were much shorter than the hoplite spears, and the narrow confines of the pass at Thermopylae negated the advantage of numbers that the Persians enjoyed. The Spartans also enjoyed tactical superiority, and their high level of discipline enabled Leonidas to rotate his men at the front line behind the Phocian wall at regular intervals to ensure that the men fought as effectively as possible. Leonidas also successfully ordered his men to stage feigned retreats before wheeling them around and inflicting maximum damage on the enemy forces, which had begun to advance in a chaotic fashion. Increasingly frustrated by the inability of his army to overcome the resistance of a tiny Greek hoplite army, Xerxes ordered his elite immortals into the fray, but even they could make no progress against the wall of Spartan shields and fell back with heavy losses. Thus ended the first day of hostilities. Xerxes knew he had a genuine problem on his hands at the end of it. On the second day of battle, Xerxes continued his frontal assault of the pass, launching wave after wave of men against the Greek hoplite wall. As the Persian king rued a second day of no progress, a local man named Ephialtes arrived at the Persian camp, offering information that would enable the Persians to win the battle. Expecting a huge reward from the great king, the infamous traitor informed Xerxes that it was possible to circumvent the Greek position by taking the narrow Anopia mountain path. Xerxes at once investigated this possibility and ordered Hydanes to lead his immortals on a special mission. With Ephialtes serving as their guide, Hydanes and his men set off at nightfall and climbed the mountain path in the middle of the night. During the early hours of the third day of battle, the Phocian contingent detached by Leonidas to guard the route heard the rustling of leaves signaling the unexpected advance of the immortals and hurried to arm themselves for battle. An equally surprised Hydanes feared that these were Spartans, but after Ephialtes informed him that they were not, the immortals managed to overcome the inexperienced Phocian hoplites and descended into the Thermopylae Pass, east of the middle gate. As a result of these developments, on the morning of the third day, Leonidas and his men faced being trapped in a pincer to the east and west. When the Spartan royal diviner, Megistias, carried out his sacrifice that morning, he read the signs of impending death, which would hardly have come as a surprise. Leonidas and his subordinate commanders decided what to do, now that their position was untenable. The account given by Herodotus states that Leonidas dismissed his allies after recognizing that they were unwilling to continue the fight. The king himself decided to continue the fight with what remained of the 300 Spartans, the Periosi and Helots, as well as the Boeotians, who chose to stay and fight. It is equally likely, perhaps more so, that the Allied contingents withdrew in fear without any orders from Leonidas. That the Spartans decided to stay and fight until the bitter end was fully expected of their warrior culture, and Leonidas might also have been persuaded to stay by the message from the oracle that a Spartan king would have to die to spare Sparta from the Persian horde. As the remainder of his army prepared to take breakfast that morning, Leonidas is supposed to have said to them, this evening we shall dine in Hades. After nine o'clock on the morning of the third day of battle, Xerxes launched his assault. Leonidas and the remaining Greeks made their last stand in front of the Phocian Wall. With nothing to lose except their lives, they fought like men possessed and inflicted more casualties on the enemy than in the previous two days. After their spears broke, the Greeks took their swords in hand and charged against the enemy, fighting hand to hand. King Leonidas fell in the melee, and the Greeks and Persians fought over possession of the dead king's body. Although the Greeks were initially successful at retrieving their fallen leader's corpse, once the outflanking maneuver was complete and they were trapped in the rear, the remaining Greeks retreated to a small hill where they fought to the end, with only the Thebans surrendering to the Persians. Of the 300 Spartans who accompanied Leonidas to Thermopylae, only two survived, neither of whom fought in the battle, a man named Pantites, 
had been absent because Leonidas sent him on a diplomatic mission to Thessaly, and when he realized he missed the battle, he hanged himself in shame. A second man, Aristodemus, was unable to fight due to an eye infection, even though a fellow member of the 300, named Eurytus, had been suffering from the same illness, he ordered his helot attendant to lead him into the battle, acting as his eyes on the battlefield, where he met his end. Upon his return to Sparta, Aristodemus was subjected to humiliation from his fellow citizens, and at the Battle of Plataea the following year, he attempted to redeem himself by breaking ranks and charging alone into the midst of the enemy. Although the Greeks lost up to 4,000 men at Thermopylae, over 20,000 Persians fell during the battle, including two of Xerxes' half-brothers. Infuriated by how much blood he had to expend in order to eliminate such a small enemy force, once the Persians recaptured Leonidas's body, Xerxes ordered the dead king to be decapitated and his head displayed on top of a pole. Herodotus noted that the Persians usually treated the bodies of fallen enemy warriors with great honor, indicating exactly how enraged Xerxes was by how Leonidas had managed to oversee the resistance at Thermopylae. The death of Leonidas led to the accession of his young son, Pleistarchus, as king. The fallen king's younger brother, Cleombrotus, was named regent for the underage Pleistarchus, and also took over command of the coalition land forces in the Peloponnese. While Leonidas and his small army fought at Thermopylae, 271 Greek triremes fought with the Persian fleet of up to 800 ships at Artemisium. On the first day of battle, the Greeks sank 30 enemy ships, while a Persian detachment sent around the eastern coast of Euboea to outflank the Greeks was shipwrecked. After a day of relative calm, the Persian fleet launched a sustained assault on the Greek fleet, and both sides incurred considerable damage over the course of the day. When Themistocles received news of the defeat at Thermopylae, he realized that there was no longer any strategic value in remaining in Artemisium, and ordered the fleet to withdraw to Salamis on the Saronic Gulf to the west of Athens. On land, Cleombrotus prepared to make a stand on the Isthmus of Corinth, by ordering his men to destroy the road leading through it and to build a defensive wall across the region. But as Athens was located in the region of Attica, located outside the wall, the Athenian citizens were ordered to abandon their city and evacuate to Salamis, and Themistocles was able to use the Athenian fleet to help out in the final stages of the evacuation. After the few remaining Athenians who barricaded themselves on the Acropolis were defeated, Xerxes ordered the city to be destroyed, and the Athenian Acropolis was razed to the ground, fulfilling another prophecy of the oracle at Delphi. Although Leonidas's stand at Thermopylae ended in defeat, and Xerxes' army continued its advance, the heroic defense of the pass inspired the Greeks to fight on, and the three days of fighting at Thermopylae provided much needed time for Themistocles to inflict significant damage to the Persian fleet. The Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies anticipated that the next phase of the war would follow in a similar vein to that of Thermopylae and Artemisium, with the Peloponnesian army fighting to hold the choke point at the Isthmus of Corinth, while the Allied navy held the Persian fleet in check at Salamis. But Themistocles had other ideas and believed it was possible to end the war by destroying the Persian fleet. Although he had received reinforcements since Artemisium and commanded a fleet of almost 400 ships, Themistocles was still outnumbered by the Persians. During the Battle of Salamis in late September, the Allied navy managed to win a decisive victory over the Persians, sinking over 200 enemy ships in the process. The naval battle marked the turning point of the war, and prompted Xerxes to return home with much of his army, fearing that the Greek fleet might sail up the Hellespont and destroy his pontoon bridges to trap him in Greece. While Xerxes personally abandoned the campaign, the war was not yet over, and the Persians continued to occupy much of the Greek peninsula. The great king left behind a large force under the command of his cousin, Mardonius, the same man who had led the invasion of Thrace in 492 BC. 
Now Mardonius evacuated Attica and spent the winter in Thessaly, while the Athenians reoccupied their native city and the Peloponnesians remained behind the Isthmus Wall. Since the Athenians lacked the protection of the Isthmus Wall, they urged the Spartans to lead an army north to attack and defeat Mardonius. When the Spartans refused, the Athenians withdrew their navy from the Allied fleet, enabling King Leotychidas of Sparta to take command. In early 479 BC, Mardonius aimed to exploit the disagreements among the Allies by sending a peace offering promising freedom to the Athenians. But this was rejected, prompting the Persian general to reoccupy Athens and completely destroy the city. The Athenian refugees appealed for military assistance from the Spartans, threatening to accept the Persian terms if none was given. After overseeing the completion of the Isthmus Wall, Cleombrotus returned to Sparta and died soon afterwards, leaving his son, Pausanias, as regent and commander of the Allied army. Pausanias raised an army of some 70,000 men, which marched north from the Isthmus, where they were joined by 8,000 Athenian hoplites. While Mardonius hoped to do battle on the open plains near Plataea, Pausanias managed to occupy a position on the heights overlooking the Persian camp. The two armies faced each other for several days before the Greeks decided on a strategic retreat to secure their lines of communication. As the Greeks were retreating in different directions, Mardonius led his army up the heights in pursuit. But, as at Thermopylae, the lightly armed Persians proved no match for the Greek hoplites, and Mardonius was killed in battle alongside more than half his army of some 120,000 men. At around the same time, King Leotychidas sought battle with the Persian fleet and caught up to it at the foot of Mount Mycale in Ionia. Rather than do battle on their damaged ships, the Persian sailors joined a large army Xerxes had left there and did battle with the Spartans on foot with predictable consequences. The twin victories of Plataea and Mycale definitively ended any further attempts by Xerxes and his successors to invade Greece and the invasion was abandoned. After the Persians evacuated Greece, the Greeks erected a stone lion at Thermopylae in memory of Leonidas, near the spot where he fell. They also raised a monument commemorating the dead with an epitaph composed by the poet Simonides, which read, quote, Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here obedient to our laws we lie. Around 40 years after the battle, a Spartan delegation sent to Thermopylae recovered the supposed remains of Leonidas and carried them back to Sparta for reburial in a grand funeral. While the Spartans worshipped all their kings as semi-divine beings after their deaths, in later centuries, Leonidas was given the additional honor of an annual festival in his name, the Leonidea. The focal point of the Spartan worship of the cult of Leonidas was a building known as the Leonideum, which may have contained the funerary monuments of Leonidas and Pausanias, the two preeminent Spartan heroes of the Persian Wars. Even though we know very little about his life, in the centuries after his death, Leonidas served as a reminder to the Spartans of their former glory. The Roman emperors sought inspiration from the warrior tradition of Sparta, and the Leonidea festival was revived during the reign of Emperor Trajan in the early 2nd century AD. The Greek historian and biographer Plutarch wrote a life of Leonidas which has regrettably not survived. The legacy of Leonidas extends beyond the ancient world. During the Italian Renaissance, the independent city-states, threatened by French and German invasion, were inspired by Leonidas and the 300 as defenders of liberty against foreign tyranny. In the late 16th century, the prolific French essayist Michel de Montaigne claimed that Salamis, Plataea, and other Greek victories against Persia paled in comparison to the glorious defeat of King Leonidas and his men in the pass of Thermopylae. In 1814, the French neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David completed his canvas of Leonidas at Thermopylae. Although his patron, Napoleon Bonaparte, was initially puzzled as to why David would choose as his heroic subject an ancient warrior who succumbed to defeat, 
he later recognized the power of the Spartans' patriotic sacrifice. The example would have seemed extremely relevant as David completed his painting after Napoleon fought a valiant but ultimately unsuccessful campaign defending France from invasion by a coalition of Austrian, Prussian, and Russian armies. In his epic poem, Don Juan, the English romantic poet Lord Byron, who championed and later perished in the cause of Greek liberation, laments the lack of valor among his contemporary Greeks. Earth, render back from out thy breast a remnant of our Spartan dead. Of the three hundred, grant but three to make a new Thermopylae. As the Royal Air Force faced the German Luftwaffe over the skies of southern England in the summer of 1940, Winston Churchill must have had Leonidas and the 300 in mind when he proclaimed, quote, Never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. Yet the legacy of Sparta was claimed not only by the Allies, but also by Nazi Germany. The organization of Spartan society with a pure-born masterclass of warriors supported by an underclass of helots, served as a model for Hitler's racial utopia, and Hermann Goering alluded to the glory of the 300 when referring to the German 6th Army surrounded by the Soviets at Stalingrad. The legacy of the Spartans, with Leonidas and the 300 as one of the most prominent examples, remains controversial and complex. While the 300 have gone down in history, as the heroes of Thermopylae, the Helots and Periosi, who had no choice but to comply with Leonidas's orders to fight to the death, have largely been forgotten. In spite of all the legends that have emerged concerning Leonidas's life over the centuries, we know surprisingly little about him. As the third son of King Anaxandridas, he went through the rigorous Agoge training program alongside his two brothers and was brought up to follow the principles of Sparta's warrior culture, including a sense of honor and glory in death. At around the age of 50, he married his wife, Gorgo, the daughter of his half-brother, King Cleomenes, and not long afterwards may have been involved in his deposition and death, following which Leonidas became one of Sparta's co-kings. He would have played a leading role in Spartan deliberations over how to deal with the Persian threat but he does not come into focus until the invasion of 480 BC. As commander of an understrength Greek army, weakened by religious obligations and a reluctance to face the enormous Persian horde, he decided to make a stand at Thermopylae, despite the poor numerical odds, offering unbreakable resistance and inflicting a considerable amount of damage on the Persian army over two full days. Even after being outflanked, he decided against withdrawing his whole army and fought a desperate rearguard action that inflicted a disproportionate number of casualties on the enemy before succumbing to the last man. While Leonidas and his army were defeated at Thermopylae, their brave resistance inspired the Greeks to triumph over the Persians at Salamis and Plataea. What do you think of King Leonidas I of Sparta? Was he a defender of freedom against a despotic imperial enemy? Or was he himself a despot who ruled over a state which routinely oppressed and humiliated its subject peoples in order to preserve the privileges and culture of a small warrior elite? Please let us know in the comments section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.